uh, I just, I don't know how else to express this to you this morning. Uh, no matter where I am or who I'm speaking to. I, I don't know what you came in here with and what your particular burden is. But I want you to know that God is bigger than your problem. He really is. That's not a catchphrase. It's not something I heard from a TV preacher and I thought it would be relevant or cute. I'm just telling you, it's the truth. And on a weekend that we're so thankful, and at a time when we're in the process of gift giving and, and thinking about the greatest gift of all, I began to think about this particular topic. How can we show the Lord that we are thankful? What is the greatest gift that we can give Him? And there could be many answers to that, but I, I don't have time to go into too many things with you. So let me just focus it on, on one idea. I'm going to call this message, Reaching the Goal. Reaching the Goal. Now, uh, most people, when they would say or think about reaching the goal, that, that, would, that would have to do with checklists. I mean, I have a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, a 15-year plan, a 20-year plan, and as I go about my business and I try to be diligent and a good steward and, and a good leader, uh, man, I'm, I'm make, I make sure I got this done, I've got this done, I mean, here's my steps, here's my, here's my checklist. And if I have enough checks on my list, therefore I have reached my goal, I'm a goal reacher, I am visionary. I, and there's a place for that, and I'm not demeaning anybody who's organized enough to do that. But I wonder sometimes if we realize that God has already covered it all. Amen? There's nobody more organized than Him. There's no, no goals that are, that are out there that haven't already been reached. Amen? And if, and, if, if, and if in Christ is truly our identity, are we really going to be defined by a checklist? Are you hearing me? So... There's something about that phrase that I, I want to get to, but I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. We're going to do just a little bit of a grammatical twist on that title later in the message to help you better understand where we're headed. But to build the case, uh, the first thing I want you to do is to go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to bounce a little bit between the life of Paul and uh, the life of Peter and John, some of the instances that they were in under this heading of reaching the goal. We open up in Philippians uh, 3, and we pick it up in verse 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Uh, and that was after sharing a, a complete checklist with those people that we'll get to in a moment. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind, and now catch this word here, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press, that's also a very important word. I press, I strain, I'm moving toward the mark. For the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul's goal in his life was reaching. And in that act of reaching, that became the goal of his life. Reaching for Paul was never about arriving. It was simply about continually reaching. And I want you to think about that for a moment as we leave Paul now and go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We'll get back to Philippians 3, but right now I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 4. The early church is now 
blowing and going, converts galore, unbelievable movement of God, spirit so great on these common men. And folks were noticing, and they just could not believe it. So many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and that they're lo- lose, uh, I mean, they're looking around, they're losing all these converts from their synagogues, they're upset about it, what in the world's going on? They're trying to check things out. Uh, people are trying to determine why this is happening. And in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, the scripture says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. As I said, the church was going, man. I mean, it was just unbelievable what the Lord was doing. And God was using these two as well as others, but in our text it talks about Peter and John, and a lot of this was going on in their home area. A lot of these folks were acquainted with the background of Peter and John. They weren't new to the scene during all of this growth. They knew them before. And uh, they knew their their background. They knew their personalities. And they were ignorant and unlearned men. They were common. And all these people are saying, now, this is not making sense. We know these people. And yet God is doing all this stuff, and He's doing it through them. And we're, we're taking knowledge of something here. Maybe the God that they're talking about, the God they're preaching about, is making a difference because I, I sure hadn't seen it in those two previously. So the first word that I want you to look at with me today, under that heading of reaching the goal, would be the word limitations. Limitations. One of the reasons these folks were having such a hard time digesting what God was doing in the life of Peter and John was because all they could see were their limitations. And normally, when we do that, that that becomes the lid, and it keeps you down. There's a ceiling on on what you can do because you're just so limited. I love basketball. I have all my life. I've played it most of my life. But for for me to uh, say, okay, I am going to to try out for the Dallas Mavericks, and I'm going to be their starting center next year. I want to tell you, at 5'7", I have a lid on those expectations. Are you hearing me? There's something there. there I mean, that, that, so, the, so sometimes limitations should be looked at. They're just some laws of nature uh, in, in effect. Amen? But I also want you to know that spiritually, with the Lord, there are no limitations. In fact, Paul said, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. And so this morning, I, I want to suggest this thought to you. Limitations are not a lid. They are a launching pad. They're not a lid. They are a launching pad, spiritually. Paul and Peter both spent time in prison, quite a bit of time in prison. In fact, much of what they wrote of Holy Scripture was in prison. It was in solitary confinement. There wasn't a, it wasn't a dorm. There wasn't a whole lot of time to move around. I mean, it was not fun It was isolated, it was cramped, it was tight. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen? We're still reading the book of Acts today, aren't we? We're still reading Philippians today as God has preserved His Word, as those men wrote it down. Why? Because, friend, I want you to know something today. God's bigger than your problem, amen? And God can do some pretty big things in some pretty tight places. You know that? I've talked about nature showing us sometimes we have limitations, but I also want you to know that nature sometimes also tells us what we can overcome. Amen? If they could talk to you, I'd like to ask the caterpillar if a tight place is a good spot for a miracle. I'd like to ask that that butterfly if the time spent in that cocoon was worth it. Amen? Amen? Because to develop into what God originally designed you to be, they had to spend some time in the cocoon, tight, can't move, pressing against that wall, developing their muscles so that at due season, at the correct time, they turn from the caterpillar into the butterfly, the beautiful designed creature that God wanted them to be in the beginning. But they would have never turned into that without the time in the tight place. Amen. 
See, that's the world may say, oh, they'll never make it. They can't do that. You can't do that. Amen. But they don't see what God sees. And they can't do what God can do. Amen. When he has a goal for you, he's going to make sure that he gets you to the, to the goal. Amen. Even in a tight place. So sometimes uh, limitations uh, come in the form of, uh, you know, what we can't do. Uh, but we can overcome that with God. The other thing I want you to look at under this point is that the other limitation is what you can do. What you accomplish in this world uh, without the Lord. And that is what Paul had. And as we go back to Philippians 3, uh, we begin to look at what he said earlier uh, to his crowd that he had in front of him. And he says this, picking it up in uh, verse number 4, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. Now, I don't have the time this morning to, to go through why, uh, that list that he just rattled off was so impressive to the crowd that he was in front of at the time. But I want to tell you that was an impressive list to that group, believe me. But here's what he was saying in verse 7. What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. He, he was saying, I've accomplished all this in my life. Now the crowd that was looking on, that was their wish list. They're hoping someday they could get a fraction of what he was rattling off there. And he already had it all. And so why he had their attention, he said, and I'll tell you what, all of that was junk. All of that was garbage. All of that was dung. Because I was reaching for the wrong things. The wrong goals. Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost uh, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now he's got some new goals, doesn't he? For whom I've suffered the loss of all things, but I count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, uh, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him. These are the new goals now. I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. Can you relate to that this morning, ladies and gentlemen? I wonder how many of us have spent too long of our lives reaching for the wrong thing. There's some people I'd like to talk to if I ever got the opportunity. I'd like to talk to Adam. What did it feel like to reach for the wrong tree? <laughs> for the fruit. So that when you eat it, it, it doesn't make you better. It doesn't give you the freedom you thought it was. It would. It would. The devil told you it would. Just makes you a slave because you're, you're reaching for the wrong things. I'd like to ask that question to the construction workers at the Tower of Babel. <laughs> I mean, they wanted to build a tower so high that it would reach to the heavens. But what they built was torn down because they were reaching to the right place, but they were doing it in the wrong way. They were reaching to the heavens, but they were trying to do it themselves. So that they can make for a name for themselves. Which reminds me of what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8 when he said, For what doth it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? Lose his own soul. We still got that crowd that are trying to build the tower. Amen. Their own way. So the scripture is not long ago and far away. We still have a world that's reaching for the wrong thing. So how do we overcome that? How do we get to uh, the, the rest of our message here? Well, can I give you a statement here? <clears throat> Your life will truly change. Not when you reach a goal that you have set. But when you reset your goals to become goals that are worth getting to to begin with. Are you hearing me? I know that sounds like a simple statement. But it's very important. Your life will truly change not when you reach a goal that you have set, but when you reset your goals to become goals that are worth getting to. <clears throat> That's what I just read to you. That's exactly what Paul was saying. 
Old goals, garbage. New goals, I'll tell you what it is, that I may know him, power of his resurrection, but he also said, fellowship of the sufferings. That's where I'm headed. That's where I'm reaching, and that's where I, what, what I want, if need be. Because my new goal is not about a place that I, I need to get to or a persona that I want to portray. It is about a person that I want to become like. That's my goal. Are you catching any of this this morning? I'm beginning to remember you all a little more quiet. Anybody out there? You with me? Okay, this means yes. This means no. Some of you give me a combination of the two so far. Too much turkey this weekend? Stay tuned. This is important. We all have heard of the Psalm 1 uh, follower of Jesus. Uh, We know some of those details. Let's just skim over that quickly. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. What's that all about? Seems to me like he's changing goals. Amen? He he's re, he'd been reaching for the wrong thing. He's not doing that anymore. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. New goals. This is the way I'm reaching now. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth uh, fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Woo-hoo! I like that line. Amen? But that's just... For reachers. Nobody else gets in that line. Amen? You don't cut in front. It's reserved for a certain kind of people. So with that thought in mind, let's jump back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, we've talked about limitations. What they can be and how God can overcome them for you. But I also want you to look at this word, intimidation intimidation not everyone was excited about what was happening in the early church and all these folks getting saved three thousand had already come to christ what a meeting i'd like to heard that sermon he well he peter didn't even get to finish it because we pick it up in verse two being grieved uh, acts four uh they taught the people and preached through jesus the resurrection from the dead and they laid hands on him and put him in hold into the next day for it was now even tied. they put him in jail they said, we're tired of this, man. We're tired of losing all those converts. We're tired of what you're saying. We don't like your message. And since we can't seem to get any satisfaction any other way, we're just going to put you in jail. At least you're not going to be able to preach. You're not going to be able to do that anymore. Both of you. Come with us now. Jail. I'll tell you, that's kind of intimidating. Amen? I'm sure that's not quite with how they thought the day was going to go. intimidation years of time have come and gone only the names have changed the devil still has intimidators out there doesn't he you can't do that you can't have that nativity scene at the courthouse well that's public property you can't pray at graduations you can't post the Ten Commandments over there. What's wrong with you? Separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. <laughs> I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. It's time for God's people to stand up for what's right and against what is wrong and not be afraid to call it what it is. We can't let this world intimidate us. I don't know how many of you saw the movie when it was in theaters earlier this year. It's on video now. My wife and I watched it the other night. A movie called Hacksaw Ridge. It tells the story of Desmond Doss, a conscientious objector in World War II. He was a medic that saved 75 soldiers in Okinawa. He was also a Christian who was unashamed to pray and to read his Bible. And his prayer, each time he went back without a rifle into enemy fire, was, Lord, give me one more. Give me one more. 
when his company was about to take Hacksaw Ridge, they would not go in until Doss finished praying for them. And he won a medal of honor for his selfless efforts. And as I watched that movie, ladies and gentlemen, I thought to myself, soldiers of the cross in the Lord's army should embrace that example. I wonder how many of us are willing to go into the enemy's camp for one more soul. I wonder how many of us would be willing to help those who are going by giving and praying. Because ladies and gentlemen, we are in spiritual warfare. And we need some people that are willing to go into the enemy's camp under intimidation. Because greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Amen. I don't care if it's in your workplace. I don't care if it's in your family. I don't care if it's in your school. I don't care if it's at the university. I'm telling you, salt and light need to be applied to be effective. And you cannot let the devil intimidate you. How many of you have ever been to Chuck E. Cheese? Or maybe a a festival or a circus. And you know one of the most popular items out there is one of those curved mirrors. Have you ever seen those? It's all built on distortion. You don't really look like that, but as long as you're standing in front of the mirror, that's what you look like. I mean, you go at a certain angle and all of a sudden your ear grows out about 10 feet. And then your buddy shoves you out of the way. So let me see. He turns his head and his forehead's about 10 feet wide. You know. Then you turn this way and your nose grows out about 8 feet. And then the parent says, well, let me get on this. You, you, you turn it this way and your stomach gets out about 4. And then you realize, oh, no, that's the regular mirror. Oh, man. I want to be. I ate too much pizza today, man. <laughs> See, that's what the devil wants to do with his type of limitation. He wants you to keep looking in that mirror and thinking that's what you really look like. He doesn't want you to look into God's mirror. He does, I'll tell you what he doesn't want you to see. Look in James chapter 1 with me. James chapter 1, we pick it up in verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving your own selves, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Now get this now. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But here's a different mirror. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, there's your mirror, and continueth therein. Do you see that? He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Literally there it means keep looking. Take a deeper look. It will give you insight into deeper knowledge. So when we press, when we reach, when we pursue through his word and in his spirit toward the things of God and we keep looking in that mirror and not be intimidated by what the devil tries to make it look like, we begin to reach our goals. Amen? We begin to take ground. We begin to take turf that he's owned for a long time. And I want to tell you, he starts getting nervous when that starts happening in a church. Are you hearing me? Reaching the goal. We're talking about limitations. We're talking about intimidation. But I also want you to note this. Expectation. Expectation. You go back to Acts chapter 4. Things are blowing and going. God is moving in such a great way. 3,000 souls already saved. I can't imagine that, boy. That's awesome. Although we're coming pretty close in India. (laughs) I'm telling you. It's Acts chapter 2 all over again. Uh, But he's taken away now. I know we're jumping back to different stories and different passages. Turn the box. We're back in Acts chapter 4. You can't do that. We're taking you away. Now, you and I both know Peter was so impetuous and 
you know, up and down and wearing his feelings on his sleeve. He's probably thinking, man, oh, now I blew it again. Things were going so well and I was feeling so good and God was all over it and then, now I'm not even there. Man, I hope I didn't blow it. I hope I didn't ruin it for the next guy. Why do I always screw up? (laughs) Are you hearing me? Expectations. Sometimes you are the last one to see the effects of your own obedience to God. While he's in jail... Everybody else is saying, this is amazing. This is awesome. Christ has changed my life. He saved my soul. 2,000 more people above the 3,000 when he left are getting saved. Amen? Whoo, what a meeting. And Peter and John are over there perhaps thinking, I hope I didn't blow it. (laughs) Because that's what happens when you start looking in the devil's mirror. Happens to the best of us. There's such a big difference between our vantage point and God's vantage point. Big difference between our goals and His goals. Paul said, when everybody thought I was winning, that's when I was really losing. And I was really losing when everybody else thought I was winning. So what happened in Paul's life? And pressing people wasn't his goal. Pressing toward God was. And so this morning, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just trying to get you to analyze your own heart. Where you stand between you and the Lord. What is it that has caused you to stop reaching? Have you had a financial setback? Has a relationship gone sour? Has somebody hurt you? Did you get a bad doctor report? You thinking, why this happening to me? Is there something floating out there in your life that you're thinking, I don't know if if that's what reaching is going to do, man. I I just don't know if I can handle that again. I, I don't know if I can do that anymore. You know, we live in a world that's addicted to impressions. First impression, second impression, Facebook impression, advertising. Image is everything. But friend, can I just share with you this morning, God is all about impact. He is all about impact. That's the price. That's the goal. And so what if reaching was the goal? Let me share that. We, we told you at the beginning of the message what we were going to come back to. So what if we change that up with a little grammatical twist on reaching the goal? What, what if we just said it this way, reaching, colon, the goal. Reaching, colon, the goal. Think about it that way. What if the thing God wanted from us all along was not that I would arrive, but simply that I would reach and I would continue to reach and that became the goal for the rest of my life. I wonder what would happen If we made that change, think about it. God's already given us some great promises for those kind of people. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. What's that all about? It's reaching. Amen? It's reaching when you don't feel like it. It's reaching when there's intimidation. It's reaching when it seems like there's all sorts of limitations. You're in a tight place. Quit reaching. The devil and demons of hell, that's what they're saying. Quit reaching. But in heaven, they're cheering us on. Amen. Cloud of witnesses. Keep reaching. Keep reaching. Keep reaching. I wonder who we're going to listen to today.
1 Corinthians 15, 58. Our work is never in vain. Amen? Never in vain in the Lord. Right? Is that not a promise? I hope you're still with me. I hope you're hanging in. We'll be done in just a moment. I heard of a story recently. A man went to heaven. Peter's leading him through heaven. He goes through door after door. All these doors had names on them. Then all of a sudden, this man sees his name over a door. And he looks at Peter and he says, uh, anything you want to let me in on? Well, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you're, you're here now. Come on, let, let's, go, let's go talk to him. He said, no, 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 no th- this, this door has my name on it. I want to see what's in here. Are you sure you want... To see what's in there? Yeah. So he opens the door. And it's this big warehouse. And it has several shelves. And on the shelves, filled to capacity, are packages. And each one of those packages had that guy's name on it. And he said... What are these packages? And Peter said, these are all of the blessings. These are all of the things God tried to ship to you. But number one, you didn't ask. Number two, you didn't believe you would get it. Number three, you doubted him. Number four, you felt you were unworthy. At that point, the man wishes he hadn't even gone into the room. Now, why would I share you share this story with you? Because I begin to think about that. Friend, when God sends you a package, he only sends it to one street. Faith Street. That's where he sends all his packages. And if you're not reaching... And staying in faith, at home, in Faith Street, all of your packages go by you. You can't let yourself wander over to Doubt It Drive, or your package goes on past you. You can't take up residence in Not Meant to Be Lane, or the package goes on by you. You can't accept the devil's false mirror and wind up on, I ain't worthy any way, or the package is going to continue to go by you. You can't let yourself be satisfied on pity me parkway when you have not because you ask not. You've got to stay in faith so it doesn't get put return to sender. Amen? On the other hand, reachers, If we will be reaching on Faith Street, stay at home, regardless of limitation, regardless of intimidation, regardless of expectation. If we stay at home and we're reaching for the package and it comes and you use them and you let the Lord multiply them just like he did with the lad and the fishes, the loaves and the bread. (laughs) Then God will multiply and God will feed And did you know, ladies and gentlemen, you can send the upgrades ahead? You can send those packages ahead. Revelation 22, 12 says, Behold, I come quickly, and my rewards are with me. And you know what he says? I'm going to give it according to as their works shall be. Are you hearing me this morning? We're still talking about those packages received at Faith Street. 
If you're reaching and you're in the right place when God sends them to you, you open them up, you're a good steward, you multiply, just like Matthew 25 with the master and the servants, five to ten, two to four, and one that buried it. Amen? It's important what you do with your package. Well, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, Hebrews 9, 27, and after this, a judgment. We don't know when that judgment is, but we know that it's after death. But, ladies and gentlemen, think about this. If you stay on Faith Street and you receive those packages and you keep reaching for the rest of your life, dear friend, I want to tell you, even death itself can't hold back the dividends on what that'll pay. Are you hearing me? Even after you, between your death and time of judgment, because there's going to be one for believers and non-believers, but you're laying up treasures where rust can't corrupt and thieves can't steal. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen? In my experience, 35 years of doing this, I've had my fill of preaching these glorious truths and watching people spend all their life on Pitimi Parkway or I Ain't Worthy Way or Doubt It Drive. I'm telling you, that changed for Paul. Amen? He said, I left that. And I haven't apprehended, but I'll tell you one thing I sure enjoyed. One thing that's been indicative of my life. I'm going to keep reaching. Let me share with this and I'll be done. Uh, if I said the name Steve Jobs, would that mean anything to anybody? Most of us know that... Uh, he was the creator of Apple computers. Here's what he said. I'm going to share this quote with you. When I look at my life, my situation now as death is coming upon me, he was dying of cancer, as most of you know. When I look at what have I, I have accomplished, the wealth that I have acquired, here's what he says, folks. It's a quote. I see that it has no meaning in comparison to what I'm going through at this moment. It is the life of a man, it seems to me, who is saying, if I could have done it again, I would have done it differently. All that he had acquired, all that he had reached for, did him no good in eternity. Friend, listen to me. You compare that to the final words of a man who was surrendered and a man who was a reacher and a man who changed his goals. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. I fought a good fight. I'm not sorry. If I had it to do again, I'd do it all again. I'd do it the same way. Jesus of Nazareth has changed me, transformed my life. I want to tell you, friend, listen to me this morning. The life of a saved man is a good life. The life of a surrendered man is a good life. Paul said it's been good. Even with all the shipwrecks, all of the stoning, all of the jail time, all of the loneliness, all of the mockery, everything that I've gone through, I want to tell you, it's been a good fight. And I'm ready. You know why he was ready, friend? Because he was a richer. And it didn't leave his package. Return to sender on Doubted Drive. He stayed at Faith Street. Rich for that package. Receiving it. Opening it. Letting God multiply it. By faith. God help us to make reaching the goal of our lives. I believe that's the best gift you could give him this Christmas. Amen. The best way you can show that you're thankful. We're going to have an invitation today. I'm sure you do that quite often here at this church. And really, we have two purposes for giving one today in particular. One is this. Friend, if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, you need to. The greatest reach of all is when he who knew no sin became sin for you and for me. 
I like that old Squire Parsons song, when I could not go to where he was, he came to me. There's a song on the table back there, when he reached down his hand for me. That he would leave heaven and come to this earth and give his life as a free gift so that you and I could know that if we died today, we'd go to heaven. I want to tell you that's the greatest reach of all. And friend, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, it's time for you to reach back to Him and receive that gift. The gift only comes to reachers. He rejects the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. If you'll reach, He'll give it to you. The second reason we give the invitation this morning is simply what I've been talking about all morning long. Friend, have you found yourself under intimidation? Have you found yourself giving up and accepting the limitations that the devil's trying to send your way? I want to tell you, maybe you've got the wrong expectations of what your life could count for, but I want to tell you, friend, the sky's the limit for those who will reach. God, help us this morning to cast off the old goals as dung and press, reach toward that mark. Amen? That God has for us. May God bless the preaching of his word. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the faithfulness of your people in the house of God. Perhaps I've gone a little bit longer than they normally do. I I really don't know. But I do know that I've shared what you have laid on my heart. And God, I see many ages here today. I see different skin colors. I I see uh, even heard different languages as as I come in. Lord, I know we've got some diversity here. But God, I, I just pray that you would help us all to understand how you want to invade every part of our life. God, I pray that there will be people here today that will recognize what a reach will do. God, I pray they would do it today. I pray in this one moment that they have that they would reach. Maybe you're calling somebody today into ministry. Maybe there's some folks that that have never tithed before that that need to reach in that way and get involved in in the ministry of this local New Testament church. And Maybe they need to join. Maybe they've been on the outside looking in, but it's time to get involved and to reach in the things of God. Lord, maybe there's problems at home or problems in the marriage and they're thinking about giving up. God, I pray that they'll reach one more time in the direction of the Master and receive that gift on Faith Street. Oh, God, help us to not let those pack, another package go by because we're somewhere else when it was sent to us. Help us today to come back home to Faith Street. Lord, I pray if there's anybody that doesn't know you as personal Savior, that today they would take care of that. By faith, in their own heart, and their own words, God, they would reach to you and ask for it right now. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.